the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whittenall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Taking the place of Mr. Henry Hazlitt, who's on a mission to Europe, is Mr. Eugene Lyons, roving editor for Reader's Digest, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Floyd Odlum, one of America's leading financiers and industrialists. In this spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion, the opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. <clears throat> Mr. Odlum, the American people know you, sir, as the head of a vast financial empire. And more recently, I believe that one of your firms has been awarded the contract for the first nuclear-propelled aircraft. Is that right, sir? Yes, I happen to be chairman of the board of the Consolidated Balti Company, which has an order to develop an atomic-powered plane. We understand, sir, that we can't discuss the actual nature of this development, but tonight we'd like briefly to discuss some of the implications yes, of this aircraft. Sir. Why uh, specifically is it important that an airplane will be powered by nuclear energy? What can it do that a, c a conventional plane can't? Well, perhaps I can say it uh, this way. The greatest progress that we are making in the uh, speeds and range of planes is being made in the fields of fuels and engines. And of course, nuclear energy is one more advanced source of power. In, in effect, a, uh, an airplane powered by uh, atom fuel, as it were, will be able to fly limitless distances, won't it? Well, I, I wouldn't want to discuss what the range of the time of life would be, because I never know when I'm transgressing secret information, and therefore I only talk about things that I see in public releases. I see, but you would say, sir, that uh, within the lifetime of most, most of us living, that we are likely to see an actual uh, nuclear-propelled uh, aircraft. Yes, I think so, and many other uh, almost equally startling developments. Well, that ought to have a profound effect uh, on strategy, and since strategy is related to diplomacy, also on foreign affairs. I would think so, very much I so. I mean, just as soon as you eliminate uh, the range in airplanes, you eliminate the necessity for distant bases. I think when the Wright brothers flew their first plane in 1908, they issue, uh, ushered in a new era. We're in the air age today. And uh, do you foresee, sir, within the next few years, the same rate of advancement in air travel that, that you've seen in your lifetime? The tempo. Yes, I believe the tempo of advancement will keep up and we will see as much in the next uh, 30 years as we've seen in the last 30 years. And well, I would like to uh, bring this up, sir, since uh, uh, airplanes cost a great deal of money and since you're a man who deals with uh, large amounts of finance, uh, what do you think uh, is the greatest danger financially to our people today? Well, the greatest danger financially to our people is the inflationary pressure that we're under for rising prices caused by shortages of civilian goods. And that is created in turn by the pressure for defense products. Do you look for the inflation to take a critical, acute form in the near future, or are you more optimistic than that? Well, I don't think inflation will take an acute form compared with its present form in the near future, but I don't see any end to the inflationary process 
unless we do a lot of things that we're not uh, doing at the present time. For instance, Mr. Odlin. Well, first and foremost, production, more production, feeding more goods out, more work. If we have more goods that the people can buy, the inflationary pressure will be reduced. Do you, would you say, sir, that the American workman today is giving a, a dollar's worth of work for the dollar he receives? Well, I, I wouldn't like to answer that question in terms of dollars. What I think is that product is a result of labor and raw materials and tools, and tools themselves are the product of labor and raw materials. And therefore, I think that the greatest thing in our national defense, as well as protection uh, for our economy, is for everyone, no matter in what uh, walk he's in, while he's at work, to give a good, heavy, honest day's work. Mr. Odlum, is there anything the ordinary mortal can do to protect himself against oncoming inflation? There is no answer. Well, I don't think that the things that one would do at the uh, heat of excitement over inflation would be helpful. They might even intensify inflation. I think that the control of inflation must come from work and produce on the part of the people and controls on the part of our government. But you do foresee, as a financier, you foresee a continued rate of inflation, something like we've had in the last uh, 10 years. We've had a creeping inflation for the last 10 years, and uh, I don't see any end to it at the present time. I think it will continue to creep along. Of course, outwardly, the country is uh, enjoying prosperity. Everyone has a lot of money. Yet there's a very definite sense of unease, of apprehension in the average American's mind. And uh, do you feel that's justified, that's grounded? In a sense, I think it's grounded. People who have money, they, uh, they fear that money is going to become less valuable, and then they start spending it. When they start spending it, they keep the wheel turning over and over and the cycle moving. I think we've all got to take a pretty serious grip on this thing, from the government to the individual citizen. Would you say that the central trouble is with our taxation system? Or at least that one of the main troubles is there? Well, our taxation system, in my uh, opinion, is not entirely right. I think that this question of stepping out each time we make a new tax and taxing the, the so-called higher brackets has not the slightest effect on inflation and has practically no effect on money raising. You, when you are going to reach money, you have to go where the money is. And, uh, I checked up not so long ago, and if they confiscated all the incomes in this country, over $50,000, they wouldn't take a tenth of 1% of uh, what's needed. So, so, uh, it's just nil. So you're implying, sir, that uh, all future taxations, uh, efforts to raise large amounts of money to finance either the defense program or a peace program, must come from people with lower income. Absolutely. It must come from the middle brackets. No matter what form you apply the tax, it's got to come because that's where the money is. I'd like to ask just this question, sir. Uh, inflation uh, is hardly a threat to me. Uh, if money uh, loses value, I don't have much to lose. You're a man who uh, guards many millions of dollars of yours and other people. Uh, are you particularly concerned uh, as a, as a trustee for this vast amount of money over inflation now? Well, it's my job as uh, the head of an investment company to protect my people as best I can about against inflation. And I do that as best I can, and I succeed pretty well. But the methods that are open in the way of investments in special situations are methods that are not generally open to everybody, and therefore it's no cure-all. How can, the, how can the little man who has a few hundred dollars to invest, how can he best safeguard himself from inflation? Well, I don't uh, know. He, Purchasing he, land or buying land a home? Land or going in a good industrial stock or something that will e equalize the purchasing value of a dollar. That's the There's best. been a bullish market in the last uh, few months. Do you consider that a healthy uh, sign or... Uh, otherwise? Well, I consider the so-called bullish market in the last two months made up partly of the uh, pressure of war orders that are now biting into the economy and we're having goods fed out, and partly a fear on the part of others that the dollar will lose some of its value and therefore they're 
wanting to buy things rather than to have money. Mr. Odlum, you're a uh, man who's made a great deal of money. Do you think that uh, American youth still has uh, the opportunities that you had as a youth? Well, there are opportunities always present, but I must admit sorrowfully that I do not believe that the youth of today has the same opportunity as the youth had when I was in that age bracket. I think that because one, there's more regimentation today, and two, because higher taxes destroy initiative and enterprise, and therefore they don't get that chance to take the big opportunity or to move from one bracket to another. Mr. Odlin, uh, Russian propaganda, communist propaganda generally, insists that the American businessmen, that capitalism wants war. Uh, what's your reply to that charge? Well, I think you've used the cr proper term, Mr. Lyons, in answering that question. You use the word pro propaganda. This is lying propaganda of the worst sort. American business cannot be helped by war. War is destructive. It's upsetting. I'm and sorry, Mr. Adlum. Thank you very much, sir. Our time is up. Thank you for being with us. Okay. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. Eugene Lyons and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Floyd Odlum. Next week, we will have with us the Honorable T.R. McKeldon, Governor of Maryland. I wonder if you know who was the first lucky woman to have a wristwatch. History tells us it was the Empress Josephine, wife of Napoleon. In 1806, there was presented to her this fabulous creation, ornamented with emeralds and pearls, and won by a pearl-studded key. The Empress was probably no more proud of her timepiece than today's owner of a long jean, who looks upon her watch as a thing of beauty a treasure fit for a queen, as well as a faithful and dependable timepiece. Let's look at some of the Longine ladies' watches of today. There's a Longine watch for every need, styled with the good taste for which Longine watches have always been noted. Sport watches with leather or suede straps, sweep second watches for nurses and other professional women, impressive bracelet watches and others set with diamonds and other gems. Longines men's watches are made in an equally wide array. When next you buy a watch, for yourself or as a gift, remember, if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. And you should insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the only watch in history ever to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards and highest honors for accuracy from the great government observatories. This is Frank Knight, inviting you to join us again next week for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.